February 12th council meeting. It is now 7 o'clock. Um, we'll start with um, general uh, public comments. Three minutes, name and resident. Martin Tripp, Oceanwood Drive. Uh, I don't know what you're doing about Pleasant Hill yet. It doesn't stand out, but it wasn't a successful farmer. They would still be farming it, and people will start to talk about trails and what they should do there. You can't just put in a trail anymore. You've got to have studies and everything like that before the council and the people in the community start to go down that trail. I'd like everybody to reflect on what the cost will be before you even start. I don't know what you're going to do. On the Sawyer Hill, I got a couple. I want to make it quick. The Sawyer Road development, they're talking about an 8,000 square foot park in a development just off of Sawyer Road as a suggestion. You got Veterans Park right here. I don't understand that. You got a whole set of, of uh, playing fields all through the school system, and almost the first thing out of the mouth and into the newspaper is a park in a development. I don't understand it. Dog parks. You know, any piece of property in the town, if they wanted to put a dog park up, if that was one of the things that had to be done, I'd say that's a great thing as long as the dog owners pay for it. There's 3,000 dogs in the town. If you spend $100,000 on a dog pound, that's $30,000 $30 a dog. There's 19,000 dollars, 19,000 people in town. That's five dollars a person. I don't have a dog. I don't feel I should spend five dollars on somebody else's dog, or my wife, or my neighbors that don't have dogs. If dog parks come up, I'll tell them any amount of money they want to spend, as long as they pay for it. And my last item is we're going to dredge this river. Bigger pipes, more water. My concern is, and you don't look at it necessarily, you're going to make a big pipe into the marsh, and there's going to be a lot more water going in there. And I'm uncertain about what's going to happen to those houses that are down by the clam bake and that back area down there. I don't know what you're going to do about it. The long-term solution has got to be someplace else besides that, but that's just some of my concerns, and I got another meeting to go to, so I just want to let you know that this is what I'm thinking about, and uh, good luck. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Liam Summers, uh, Holmes Road in Scarborough. I uh, just wanted to take a moment to share with you concern I have regarding the ad hoc committee. I uh, sat in on a few of those meetings, attended a few of those meetings to see uh, how they went, and I just want to share concerns I had. First and foremost, uh, there can be no doubt that that committee was specifically set up to deliver a preordained outcome. The composition of that committee comprised of four very strongly anti-dog Audubon Society members, supporters, is a clear signal that the committee was stacked toward a very specific agenda. Additionally, allowing Mr. Donovan a seat on that committee to develop a proposal that he will then vote on uh, is nothing short of a conflict of interest. Compounding that, having Mr. Hall serve as a moderator for the committee is also a conflict considering he is employed at the will of this council. If perception is reality, then the reality is that this was never intended to be a fair or objective process, but rather a means to an end to ensure the recommendations would support the council objectives. While allowing this council to claim some due process was provided, and th but this charade is not going to fly with the public. The council conveniently forgets that the majority voted to repeal their ordinances just a few short months ago. Yet this committee, was only provided a minority of members that would have represented that position. That is unconscionable. Once again, the majority are forced to fight a battle from an untenable position. Now, there are several Freedom of Information Act requests still pending, but 
one has already been fulfilled. And the results of that not only contradict the statement that there is a silent majority urging this council to take action, but also shows a pattern of abuse of authority and more troublesome, specific direction to undermine the democratic vote that took place by working on drumming up charges of non-compliance with the current ordinance. I remind this council that they serve at the will of the people. Each of you were voted into office to serve the best interests of the citizens of Scarborough in a democratic manner. And I urge you to carefully consider the actions you take from this moment forward. Thank you. My name is Robert Rosner. I live at 4 King Street in Scarborough. Good evening to all the ladies and gentlemen of the council. I'm sorry that not all seven of you are here this evening. Um, Liam stole a little bit of my thunder, um, but I'll try to get through this as best I can. The dictionary um, gives a definition of the word ethical as in accordance with the accepted principles of right and wrong governing the conduct of a group. And it goes on to define the word integrity as a rigid adherence to a code of behavior, a probity. I, like Liam and many of the other citizens, have attended every ad hoc committee meeting, and I, like Liam, find, I don't find a problem with one of the council people being on the ad hoc committee. I do find a problem, however, that we understand now where your council brethren comes in on the vote. And I understand that within the next week or whatever, you folks are going to be presented with several different cases and scenarios to make a final decision. Mr. Donovan, your council member who appeared on the committee, we understand where he stands. He's voted what will be called the majority opinion every piece of the time as, a, as opposed to the minority opinion. So I request from you tonight, with careful deliberation, that one, either Mr. Donovan take it upon himself to recruit himself from being able to vote on any final decision that this board council makes. Instead of having seven people vote, assuming everybody shows up, they're not here tonight, but assuming they all show up, that would give you a vote of six people. By not doing that, I believe that the council has allowed a nail to be put in the coffin even before the discussion and deliberation of the council begins. It means that if seven people vote, one vote, 25%, has already been given to the majority opinion without careful consideration to anything else. I find that to be unconscionable, to steal a word from, from Liam. <clears throat> I ask you, and I'm probably pleading with you, to please think of this carefully and to think of all the people in town who put a lot of time together. I believe it's within this council's responsibility to be fair and to be ethical and to vote with integrity. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? If I see no one else, uh, I'll close the public comment. Minutes of January 18th, regular meeting. Any errors or omissions? Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? So moved. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? Uh, I have one. And um, it will be resolution in order 14-02. Okay, we'll 
we'll be putting that in as a uh, non-action item after Project Grace. Items to be signed, Treasurer wants, I have them here. I'll be signing them as the meeting goes on. Um, item 8, um, non-action items, and it's an uh, update from Project Grace regarding the Fuel Assistance Program. I believe I have Steffi Cox. Uh, please. Uh, good evening. I'm Steffi. I'm with Project Grace. And I thank the Council uh, for your time tonight to tell you a little bit about our shared work on raising money to keep our neighbors warm. Um, this is the third year, I believe, that Project Grace and the town have worked together on a Scarborough Fuel Assistance Fund. We're very gratified to have your partnership and uh, telling the story of the needs that our neighbors have in terms of keeping their houses warm. Project Grace is a nonprofit for those of you who don't know us. Um, we're a nonprofit um, based here in Scarborough, working primarily right here in Scarborough, and we're, except for me, an all volunteer group. And um, I have a great team of dedicated people who pick up the phone when someone has um, a need and they need help figuring out how they're going to pay a bill or get sneakers for their kids or get some food on the table, just basic, everyday, not very fancy, but incredibly important needs. Um, and it's, it's not an easy call for people to make, and the volunteers who answer the phone are um, compassionate, very practical, and also very good stewards of the trust and gifts that they receive from the community at large. And the Scarborough Fuel Assistance Fund is one of the ways that we meet an increasing need um, to keep our homes in town here uh, cozy and warm when the weather is as cold as it has been. Just a few numbers to, to share with you. Uh, last year, we spent about $44,000 on fuel assistance for our neighbors living here in Scarborough. Um, the year before that, it was $35,000. Last year, we helped about 84 families, I want to say, close to 84 families. Um, this year, we've already helped close to 60 families, and we're on track to spend about $30,000. We spent we helped 30 families in January alone of this year, and as of the first week of February, we had helped a dozen families. That's in the first week of February. I uh, spoke to a gentleman today who, uh, he, he said, honey, I cheated a little on the thermostat. I boosted it up to 61. He's over 80, and his house is not even 61 degrees most of the time. I challenge all of you listening at home to get up, turn the thermostat back, and, and feel that. It, it makes me um, upset uh, to think about the needs that are out there. But the part that you can't see is also how um, our hearts at Project Grace just sing with happiness at the amount of love and support that our community gives. For those of you like Councillor Katerina who were present at the fuel rally that was hosted by Project Grace and the town um, at the Oak Hill Fire Station in two hours, two hours, it's very exciting. You could drive right to the firehouse and throw money at the handsome firemen, or you could go inside <laughs> and give it to some of our volunteers. Um, in about two hours, we raised nearly $10,000. We raised... Um, an incredible amount of support and help from the community at large because we don't think, and I, I speak we, don't think our neighbors should be suffering and in the cold. You'll hear from uh, Ellen soon too, who is uh, director of the Scarborough Food Pantry. Um, we get a lot of thank you notes from people who say, hey, I just got a food card from you, or hey, I opened up my food basket at Thanksgiving. It's the first time we've had peanut butter in three weeks. Mm. And, you know, what? peanut butter is not a luxury for most of us. For some people, it's, it's how, how they keep their kids fed and well. And I think that it's important that our town has this partnership that is municipal, community, and nonprofit, um, because together we're figuring out a solution. We're figuring out that if each of us does a little bit, 
the rest of us can make it through a tough, tough winter. Um, so I'd like to recognize the staff and um, team members here at Town Hall, like um, Bruce Gullifer and Marcia in Community Services, uh, Mike Shaw in Public Works, Chief Mike Thurlow and the firemen um, at, at the Oak Hill and other stations, um, Chief Robbie Thurlow and Officer Eric Greenleaf and the others who um, represented the Yellow Dot program and the officer who um, did a demonstration with uh, his canine partner and all the others who um, came out and stood out in the cold. It was cold, was it not, G. Marie? It, it was, was a pretty was cold like day. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'd also like to recognize the staff at the school schools. Uh, together with um, the nurses, the social workers, the teachers, the lunch ladies, and all the other caring staff there who keep a sharp eye out on the kids and they tell us, you know, that kid is sharing shoes with his brother or that little kid doesn't have a jacket. Um, they tell us when a family needs something and together we work to try to make sure that um, we can quietly, privately, and with dignity, help our neighbors through a tough time. I want to share just two quick numbers with you to help you understand. It's easy to think it's the same old people calling. And that's not the case. When we uh, work with uh, community services to make sure kids have a safe place after school or during summer camp, most of the families getting a little nudge and a little help from us to pay fees or, or what have you, they might get help for one or two years in a row, maybe. But most of them are only getting help for one season at a time. It's the same, too, when we looked at our numbers around fuel assistance, which is why I'm here today. We looked at um, how many families have we helped last year, and I'd said, you know, about a little, somewhere around 85 families. Um, I shake a little bit because sometimes we're helping with fuel and sometimes we're fixing a furnace. Sometimes we're uh, helping somebody uh, make a, a minor repair so that their, their, uh, their furnace or what have you runs more efficiently. So it's hard for me to count exactly how many families, but it's around 85 families. Um, of those families, this year we have about 42 of them. We didn't hear from them this year. So about half the families did not call us. That means they're doing fine, right? They found a way to, to take care of their needs. Um, on the other hand, 30 new families have called us. So that's why when you, you see our numbers staying pretty steady around that, um, I want you to think that they're, they're not necessarily always the same family in that, in that bundle of numbers. Um, hard times can hit any one of us. Many families are a paycheck or a job or an injury away from not being able to pay their bills. And, um, and many of them are also a paycheck, a job, good health, away from turning things around for their family. So um, what we're seeing is that there's a fairly steady need. You can look in any neighborhood, even the fancy ones, you know, behind that fancy door is often somebody who's either cold or hungry or struggling to make it work. Um, but also the generosity and the partnership is coming from every neighborhood around town and pretty much every group. And I want to highlight two gifts and then entertain any questions you might have. Um, we received a challenge grant from Eddie Wooden. Many of you know him as a, a benefactor of many causes here in town. Um, we also received a combined $6,000 in gifts from the faith community this year. Um, everything from giving trees to passing the plate to having a, a, a supper or some other fundraiser on our behalf, a chowder challenge or something like that. And I also received $180 from some sixth graders who baked some cupcakes. Mm -hmm. so, um, everybody is helping. And um, I wanted to come and thank you all for that and to thank the town for uh, the assistance that they continue to provide to us so that we can answer the phone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, we have, Steph, uh, I don't know if there are any questions uh, that members of council ha have for Steffi. I do that first. Well, I don't have a question. Uh, I have maybe more of a statement. Um, I asked Call at our um, Tom's very handy assistant mm -hmm. to set us up with the Clink program oh, okay. um, to partner for you for Project Grace and for the field program. And um, so, my fellow counselors, I have a challenge for you. It's a <laughs> box of bags. So, my challenge is each of us has 15 bags. 
So whether you can fill them to mm -hmm. yourself or you go to your neighbor's house and say, fill this bag for me so I can bring it back, um, each of you needs to do 15 bags. How long and that includes you. How long, how, long, how long do we have? How long do we have? It's cold right now, so right. do it as quick as you can. How about an awful lot of soda or whatever type of beverage you drink? That's it. That's it. We, we have the, the kind of the, the clean uh, package, if you will, in. So these bags will have the stickers already on them. We'll have those all broken out and distribute them at your next meeting next Wednesday. So. Perhaps between now and then you can talk about the time frame for the challenge. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but we'll have that ready to go a week from tonight. Okay. I accept the challenge. <laughs> All right. That's great. Well, you're a brave council. And I'll challenge those at home. You can join in the challenge. You can drop your kink, clink strip. Uh, those clink slips, you can put them in the bin at the Hannafords, you know, that little right. Pyrex thing in front of the door. Just put your clink slips in there, we'll tally them up, and we'll see if you can beat the town council. Uh. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, just to beg the indulgence of council for a few more moments, while Steffi's here, we've also invited uh, Ellen, I believe, from uh, uh, Scarborough Food Pantry, associated with the First Congregational Church. Why don't yep. you step up? This year, uh, a very proud of town staff, uh, we held an annual winter party, uh, totally funded through employees, either ticket sales or through the payroll deduction program. But we did a silent auction, and that auction raised uh, over $1,100. And it is to benefit both the food pantries. And so we have a number of members of uh, the committee that planned the event, and I'd like to just read their names, and a couple of them will come up. Sean Bushway, uh, Kathy Chandler, Gina Klucke, Nicole Hall, Jacqueline Mandrake, Karen Martin, uh, Colette Matheson, Heidi Midnish, Carrie Noyes, Tom Rainsborough, Sarah Salisbury, Julie Sanford, and Mike Shaw were on our committee. And Gina Kluke is making her way up to make a presentation to the food pantry. <laughs> I just want to take a second, thank you for your time, to recognize everyone who supported the silent auction and donated items for our silent auction. Um, that includes Piper Shores, Valari Self-Defense Center, Bruce Gulliver, Jen Nichman, Paul Lesperance, Sean Bushway, Toady Justice, Jay Nason, Tom Rainsborough and John Reed, Karen Martin, Mike Shaw, Chief Moulton, Rainey Daniel, uh, Tom Hall, uh, Scarborough Grounds, Cheese Iron, Sarah Salisbury and Nicole Hall. So those are all the individuals who donated auction items. And um, like Tom said, we raised over $1,100. So I'm, I'm really excited. And congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Certainly, thank you. Ellen, did you have anything to say? Don't feel obligated. I just stand up next to the podium. Okay. No, thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, next. Is Resolution 1402 a resolve to urge the main state legislation to provide and enable prop a property <coughs> program? Um, so I'm going to read this in the form of a motion. Um, resolution 14-02, urging the Maine State Legislature to provide and enable property tax relief programs, be it resolved by the Town Council of the Town of Scarborough, Maine, and Town Council assembled that, whereas in 1987 the so-called Circuit Breaker Program was established as a way to provide relief for property taxpayers, and whereas with the enactment of the state budget in 2013, which is PL 2013, Chapter 368, Part L, the 126th legislature terminated the circuit breaker program and installed the property tax fairness income tax credit, which imposes more restrictive income requirements and significantly limited the maximum rebate. And whereas the more stringent requirements of the new property tax fairness credit are likely to limit the number of Maine residents eligible for the credit and thereby significantly reduce the amount of property tax relief provided, and whereas in addition to the sweeping changes to the program, Part L of the state budget enacted in 2013 inadvertently removed the authority for municipalities to sponsor local property tax relief programs. And whereas LD 1607, an act to reinstate statutory authority for local property tax assistance programs, was drafted to correct the error and provide the authority for local property tax relief programs and is pending in the current legislative session. 
and whereas in view of the significant and reductions in revenue to municipalities that have occurred or are pending action by this legislature, cuts to municipal revenue sharing, which result in increases in local property taxes, the changes to the circuit breaker program only further burden the taxpayers of Scarborough. Now, therefore, be it hereby resolved by the town council in the town of Scarborough assembled as follows. Okay. Um, that in the, it is of critical importance that the legislature reconsider and create a structure similar to the former circuit breaker program that targets a similar population of main property taxpayers and that it is essential that municipalities be granted the authority to operate in locally funded property tax relief program at their discretion, and that the town council urges the local legislative delegation to support the reinstatement of a state-operated and funded property tax relief program similar to the former circuit breaker program and provide full support to the adoption of LD 1607. I have a second. Second. Any discussion? Yeah. Jean Murray? Uh, I would just like to say that I'm very proud of my fellow councilors for doing this resolution and the prior resolution that we did regarding the municipal revenue sharing. Um, it does make a difference when we speak up as communities uh, to the state legislature. They hear us. They know uh, what we're asking for. And I have every hope that they will listen to us on this also. Thank you. I guess I, this stems from, um, and, and, and thank you, Tom, for, mm -hmm. for writing this. You're far better at it than I am. Um, something that you may or may not realize, um, like, like the document suggests, in by doing what they have done, they have also re removed our ability as a community to have tax relief. And what that means for somebody in Scarborough right now is, the only way you received our tax, tax property relief program is if you were 65 and older and you had to already receive the circuit breaker program so, and you also lived in your home for 10 years. So what this means to somebody in our community right now is somebody who is very much on a completely fixed income, has no means and no recourse to replace this loss of income. And what they're facing right now is a $2,000 loss this year. If you were receiving 1500 from Circuit Breaker and now you're losing the 500 from the town, this is of a significant impact to those people. Um, and then, of course, add on your tax bill and any increase that comes from this year. So this is highly, highly important for these people. Um, and if the state legislature does not do this, there are horrible repercussions from this. Yeah. With, uh, also with that, if they don't change the program, the um, we're unable to administer the $500. So they at least, uh, we'd like them to reinstate it. However, um, the, at the least, um, allow us to our allocate our own funds for that program. With that, um, all in favor? Opposed? I see none. It's a vote. Thank you. Order number 14-09 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the request from Valentine Development Inc. to extend the T&D Overlay District to include property located at 38 Westwood Avenue, map U43, lot 24, currently zoned R4. Okay, this is a public hearing. Um, name and address. But first, we're going to read a uh, letter into the... Um, which one? Uh, which one? Uh, Mr. Hazen? Yes. Okay. Uh, this is an individual who owns property at 34 Westwood Ave. Its name is George Hazen. I'm a property owner of 34 Westwood Ave, which is an abutter to 38 Westwood Ave. I am unable to attend the meeting on February 12th because of the short notice. I oppose order number 1409 to extend the T&D overlay district to, to 38 Westwood Ave. There are matters among the involved parties in this transaction that need to be known by all. In the town council meeting in 2005, the town was to have a new traffic pattern. None has been, none has been done for Westwood Ave and the Oak Hill intersection. 
the future road leading from the development to US Route 1 will burden Westwood Ave and the adjacent streets. The traffic is already backed up on these streets during busy hours. The residents of Westwood Ave and the adjacent streets have petitioned the town not to have Westwood Ave as a connector between this development and the new development in the 19, early 1990s. Um, I have requested a 30-day delay in this vote so that I can get pre representation at the town council meeting, but nobody has responded to my request in the town of Scarborough. And then he just asked to contact him. Okay, with that, um it may behoove uh, the applicant and as well as the council for oh. Dan Bacon just to give okay. some introductory remarks to kind of put the request in context. If, if uh, you'd be willing, I think it might serve your purpose well. Uh, I'm happy to. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Dan Bacon, uh, town planner. I'm just going to provide a quick introduction on what the TND or the traditional neighborhood development option is and also to just clarify what the process is for designating it or extending the designation, because it's actually a little bit different than your typical zoning ordinance amendment. Um, and for those at home and, and perhaps some newer counselors who weren't involved in the original adoption of the, the TND, um, quickly, TND st stands for Traditional Neighborhood Development, and it's essentially a design option that's allowed for um, larger parcels of 25 acres or more in the town's R4 districts, which are the residential districts um, in the town's growth areas around Oak Hill, um, in the Dunson area. And uh, traditional neighborhood development in general is characterized by neighborhoods that have different housing types, uh, a mix of housing types, typically smaller lots, um, interconnected streets, streets designed for pedestrians, etc., and some common green space. If you've been through Eastern Village, that gives you a flavor for the design. Also, Dunstan Crossing is a similar um, development design. And um, because these neighborhoods really require larger parcel sizes, that's why the 25 acres or greater was established back in 2004 for the designation of this type of neighborhood. Um, they're also required to be on water and sewer service. And um, how the zoning ordinance structured um, the designation of the TND is, again, it's not a full-blown zoning map change or map amendment, but rather if a property meets the criteria for a TND, being in the right zone, having enough acreage, having public water and sewer, then the council can designate the property through a public hearing and action um, without first reading, second reading, planning board, uh, public hearing, can designate an area for the TND. Um, so before you tonight is currently there's the TND that applies to Eastern Village. It's about 50 acres um, between Black Point Road and Commerce Drive. What's being requested, and, and Mr. Anderson's here, I'm sure, to answer questions and to provide more details on his goals for the designation. But what's being requested is to add additional two and a half acres to the overall TND. Um, so that's about 53 acres or so. Um, so I just wanted to provide a little bit of background. It's a bit odd compared to your typical zoning amendment. It's not really a zoning amendment. It's really an action by the council to decide or not whether it meets the criteria for a TND and then in this case extend the designation to this additional piece of property. So. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. My name is Kerry Anderson. I represent Ballantyne Development. How much time do I have? Whatever you need. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, just uh, by way of history, um, I By way of history, I came to the uh, town in 2005 to the town council requesting a TND zone uh, specifically for this piece of property per the comprehensive plan then. It uh, talked about um, uh, developing parcels that are in the town center in a walkable manner with sidewalks, street trees, uh, smaller lots. Um, and the traditional neighborhood 
development overlay allows us to do that. It also allows us to narrow the streets up somewhat, narrow the curb rate eye up some, somewhat so that it's, it's um, more walkable, uh, easier for kids to uh, ride their bikes, which we have going on a lot down there during the summer, even through the construction phase. And um, uh, we also have taken it a step further to uh, f um, try and build a a uh, neighborhood that is reminiscent of what you would have seen 100 years ago, uh, both architecturally, uh, both in vertical scale, both in materials used, and so on and so forth. The, the parcel that we're talking about, uh, that we're asking for the TND overlay to extend over is this parcel right here, excuse me, it's only one of three remaining parcels in um, this side of Oak Hill that have any size to them. And given what we believe in and given what we uh, believe a walkable town center should look like, we think it's the right thing to do to extend that over our parcel so that it can be developed consistently with, with what ultimately we're trying to achieve down below here. In 2005, we, um, in coming to the council, we also had a planning board uh, process where we had public hearing, talked to the planning board, and in, at that time, we, we had five ways into the neighborhood. We could come down Commerce Drive, as we do now. We could come down the Eastern Trail, as we uh, can now at the time, didn't have an easement. Uh, we can come down Ward Street, which comes up to a signalized intersection right here in front of Town Hall. We could have gone across the property where Seven Oaks development is. We maintained a right of way through there. And we could come down through Westwood. We asked the planning board at that time, there's five ways in, which ones do you want us to pursue? And they said, we would like you to pursue Commerce Drive, Eastern Road, Ward Street. We don't see, uh, we don't have uh, interest in you pursuing Seven Oaks for somewhat obvious reasons. And we also don't uh, want you to pursue Westwood Avenue, which we didn't. And in this um, request, we're actually not proposing to use Westwood Avenue. Um, there's one particular individual that we speak to on a somewhat regular basis that we know uh, has objection to that, and we, uh, we respect those wishes. So uh, if this parcel is, uh, if the TND overlay is extended over this parcel as we believe it absolutely should be, um, we would propose to use it via Ward Street and if the town at some point in the future uh, believes that Westwood Avenue is something that should be um, made as an access point, they can pursue that, but we don't have any interest in pursuing that. The, um, the process, as Dan spoke about, is, is somewhat unique from what typically would be with a zoning change, a zoning change uh, typically is the council, planning board, public hearing, back to the council, first reading, second reading, public hearing, and then finally a vote, along with a change to the zoning map. The TND overlay was, was designed much differently, so it just required one council meeting, um, and it could be just, obviously there's an advertisement, and it could just be a, a public vote. So if the council saw uh, fit, they could uh, vote it up or they could vote it down, but there would not need to be any change to the zoning map nor going to the planning board and whatnot. So the process is, is much simpler. The, um, with respect to Ward Street, we have somebody, we have a, we have an, in, we have a family right now that lives in, in Eastern Village who, uh, it's a lady who's a school teacher, she's a Scarborough school teacher, she's, she's married, has two kids. She walks every day to work uh, down our muddy, dirty uh, Ward Street temporary road connection, but she does it pretty much every day. 
Uh, we've also had a number of people who are living down there currently who've asked when Ward Street um, can become more passable uh, as the only purpose that we are using it for currently is really kind of heavy equipment. We've done that somewhat at the town's request to keep some of the heavy truck traffic, uh, concrete trucks, lumber trucks fully loaded, um, heavy equipment that gets brought down on low bed off of a road that in the near future we'd like to turn over to the town and make it a public road. Each year that goes by that we hold off on doing that, the pavement prices continue to get higher, but we do understand the town's concern and we agree with it and we've been willing to do it. But Ward Street is meant at this point just to become something that heavy equipment would use and not necessarily the public from down here until we improved it to that point. But people are certainly welcome to walk up it. We do have a lot of people that do that. Some people walk their dogs up there. Some people are walking to work, as I mentioned. Um, and with this parcel, the parcel that we're asking to get uh, the overlay district on, we would actually probably develop it sooner rather than later if we were going to take Ward Street and make it more uh, bring it up to a kind of street acceptance standard, if you will. The other phase that we've got here, which is phase nine, it's a much bigger uh, bite, uh, chunk to bite off. There's wetlands involved, there's complicated drainage issues involved, and the parcel that we're asking for the overlay on is uphill of where the utilities are, so everything can be gravity. It's a smaller piece very conducive to what we're trying to do. So that's the reason, another reason why we're coming in here at this point asking for that. Now the flip side of it is we can develop it as an R4, which I actually designed while I was eating dinner tonight. It doesn't take much time. The purple is, because I didn't have a black uh, marker, or crayon rather, but the purple is what you could use as the road to get in. We had it shown connected up to Westwood, mainly just so that if a plow truck came down here, they had a place to turn around and, and come back this way. There's currently access down through the property to this parcel down here, uh, which is owned by Danny Sullivan. Um, but again, we, you know, we're not, even in this design here, we're, we're not asking to connect it up to Westwood. We have no problem not connecting it to Westwood whatsoever. And frankly, in respecting some of the wishes of people that don't want to see it connected up to Westwood, like Mr. Hazen, we're in agreement. <laughs> so, um, but this is a standard uh, R4 uh, design. I don't see it changing much. It took me about 15 minutes to put together. It doesn't call for any uh, sidewalks, street trees. Uh, none of the things that the TND calls for, or spells out rather. Um, so this is kind of a option, if you will, currently, or we could develop it more consistent with what we think is the right thing to do in the town center, which is to develop it as a TND overlay. Um, that is really all I have. Um, at this point, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I think the request is pretty straightforward, um, and I hope you uh, support it. Like, uh, I hope you support what we're trying to do because I got to tell you, we work three times as hard to develop this, and um, it takes three times the time. Uh, but we're really building something that's very unique, very special, and the people that are living down there. Um, the moment they come down and they see the neighborhood, they know immediately that this is where they want to be. It's, it's pretty, it's kind of the way that we thought it would go, uh, not necessarily velocity wise because of the economy, but when people come down and they tell us how they've fallen in love with what we're doing, uh, we do take pride in that and we're trying to further uh, that so that more of Oak Hill can look like what we believe is a walkable, traditional town center design. With that, Mr. Chairman, that's all I have. Okay, what, what I'm going to do is um, first I'm going to take uh, questions from the public or comments. 
and because they may create some questions for you, Mr. Anderson. So um, then we'll go with questions from counselors. So I'll uh, open up to the public if anyone would like to speak, uh, comments on the uh, proposal. Good evening. My name is Stephanie Dickey Rule. I live at 21 Fairfield Road with my husband and two children. We are very opposed to Carrie Anderson's development, Eastern Village, acquiring access to come out um, onto Westwood Avenue through the back of, this, of his development for the following reasons. Before this development is given any approvals early on, at its conception, this project should have received serious thought and consideration should have gone into the ingress and egress of this development. I do not think that our close-knit uh, neighborhood, and that is the streets of Libby, Westwood, and Fairfield, um, housing young children, teenagers, middle-aged parents, and the older folks, some who have lived in this neighborhood for close to 40 years or more. I do not believe that we should be asked to hear the, uh, bear the burden of any additional traffic. Westwood Avenue and its adjacent streets of Fairfield and Libby already act as cut-throughs during peak commuting um, hours, both morning and evening. Cars treat these streets as a racetrack, speeding up or down them trying to cut out the failing intersection at Route 1 or to get out on to Black Point Road quickly. Not to mention cars down, coming down Westwood Avenue too fast, they are no notorious for making their left onto Thornton Road on the wrong side of the road. This is our neighborhood, our livelihood, and, this is, and, and there is already too much traffic in a small area, and the bad planning needs to stop. If this item receives approval tonight or at any time in the future, a disaster is bound to happen, and that will be pitiful. For those of us living, living in the neighborhood, we already have um, to map and plan which way we can best get to where we are going. It is already most always impossible to take a left onto Route 1 from any of our streets now, Libby, Westwood, Fairfield. Please do not place excess burden onto Fairfield, Westwood, or Libby streets any further. The smartest decision would be for traffic coming from the Eastern Village to come out onto Ward Street where there already exists a traffic signal or out onto Commerce, um, out Commerce onto Route 1, again, where there's a traffic signal. And furthermore, while I am not a direct abutter to 38 Westwood Avenue, I should have been given the respect from the town to be notified along with the rest of my neighbors. I was notified when the proposal by Wegman came about for the assisted living facility on Black Point Road last year. And I consider, consider the distance from it to be consistent with the distance between us and 38 Westwood Avenue. Back in 2005, this applicant was before the planning board with a similar request as tonight, as you all know. But at that time, they did not want him to use Westwood. And in closing tonight, I'm also requesting that you please do the right thing where this matter is involved and vote no. Finally, short of insisting, I am, in, I am asking that Chairman Sullivan recuse himself from this matter and voting, especially since his property located at 1 Sullivan Farm Road and his family's property abuts this parcel of land known as 38 Westwood Avenue, which in my mind creates a conflict of interest so that you will remain unbiased in this matter. Please recuse yourself. And Carrie Anderson's Eastern, uh, uh, where this matter is concerned with Carrie Anderson's Eastern Village. Again, please do, do the right thing where this matter is involved. Vote no. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening. This is not something I do all the time. My name is Lorraine Levy. I live on Westwood Avenue 29, right ob almost opposite to Thornton Road that goes over to Wright Point Road. And I agree with everything that <coughs> Stephanie had to say about traffic coming down that road and going around the corner onto Thornton Road. Uh, 
the cars that go by my house, some of them aren't wasting any time. The house, our house was built in 1947 when I graduated from South Portland High School. My father wanted a place to live, so he built the house. And uh, I've been, well, I haven't been there, but they were there until my father died, and then my mother lived there alone. And we bought the house so she could stay there, and uh, she died just short of 108. Hmm. So uh, wow. we do have, my father did make plans to be put on the sewer when he, we built the house. Uh, and we have water. We don't have a well. We have water. Uh, we had a survey around the property. We have three acres of property. It abuts uh, carries in back. And uh, so I had little markers built all around the property. And when uh, several years back, when someone came to measure the property for something to do with getting down and, and back, and I don't know exactly what. But when I went down and looked, they had removed the signs that we had put up for the boundary at that point. And I had asked whoever did it, and I don't know who did it, if they would please replace them, and they never did. So if necessary, I will have to replace that road, that barrier that goes down um, Westwood Avenue. Uh, I really don't. I think Stephanie covered it pretty well, and I I, I agree with her completely. Uh, Ward Street is a much better answer than uh, trying to use Westwood. And as as Stephanie mentioned, to try to make a left turn on a Route One in the summer, particularly, and during the day most of the time. And there are there are traffic lights at Ward Street that can be used, and uh, I guess maybe that's all that uh, I can add to what Stephanie said. But I do hope that nothing is done with. I don't see how they can take that Westwood Avenue and make a two-lane road out of it and still have not run over everybody and everybody's car and what have you. It just doesn't make sense. So I hope that Westwood isn't involved in anything. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? <coughs> Is there anyone else? Uh, my name is John Cahill. I live at uh, 24 Westwood Avenue. I've been there for 41 years. And um, I really love our little neighborhood. It's a special place. Uh, I watched a lot of, I've taught school here for years, and um, I, I was Richard's teacher right. many years ago. <laughs> and um, my main concern is that that road not be used as, um, and Mr. Anderson said that he didn't intend to use that road as, as a possible uh, through, drive through to Route 1. But what I'm concerned about is right now, um, according to his maps, um, that isn't the intent, but the possibility, once that is uh, developed down there, um, for that to change, that's my concern. Um, right now, maybe in the next year or two years, maybe that won't be the case, but if in the future, um, that is a right away through to Route 1, it'll pretty much destroy that neighborhood. The traffic is backed up now uh, going out onto Route 1, um, going up Westwood Avenue. And if we have it, we can't put another stoplight there. Um, as far as I'm concerned, um, from what I've heard, uh, originally they didn't want to uh, use Westwood Avenue because of traffic flow problems, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I've heard all kinds of other rumors about how they're planning on putting a, a um, a convenience store and filling station down in there somewhere. I, I, I don't know how that would happen. But, uh, you know, this, these are rumors. I'm sure that's not the case. But um, my main concern is that we maintain the integrity of, of what is really a nice little neighborhood for all the people who've lived there for all these years. And, uh, and that's, that's basically my concern. So thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Peter. Is there anyone else? I'd just like to speak before. Yes, we... you may. Uh, anybody else? Okay. And then that will. Um, We'll let you uh, actually we're going to end the public hearing and we'll move on to uh, any comments you'd like to make and then councillor questions. Thank you. I think I'd just like to say I've stated on the record several times we don't care to use Westwood Avenue. We have plenty of ways into the neighborhood now. We have a DOT permit that exceeds the number of dwelling units that we would put in Eastern Village that we've had for probably six or seven years now. Um, so the ways in that we have now uh, meet everything that we want to do and in more than what we want to do in its current uh, dwelling number. I think that the, the request by me to the council tonight is, because I'll be coming back to do this or I'll be coming back to do something like this. Um, I think that what I'm asking the council here is, would you rather see it done like this? And if not, then I'll simply come back and request something like this. And obviously traffic matters will be fully vetted out with the planning board, you know, all the various studies and engineering and everything else. So um, I hope you don't vote no because you're voting no, not necessarily on the traffic, You'd be voting no on what you think the property should be developed to look like. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Um, is there any questions before? I have a question, but, but it's for Dan. Oh. So. <laughs> I have a question for Karen. Okay. Well. They already swapped. Yeah, <laughs> My, fault. Okay. Okay. <laughs> My fault. My uh, fault. Well, actually, I had kind of two questions. Sure. Um, so I'm going to ask you, and I just want to make sure, um, kind of reiterating on Kerry saying that no matter what, he has the capacity to develop this site, whether it's T&D or R4, that there really is no roadblock with the privilege of developing it. Yeah, it's zoned for residential development. It's, I think Kerry's correct in saying it can be developed using just the standard R4 um, space and bulk requirements, or it can use the TND design requirements, which produce two different products, but it's still housing units on the property one way or another. My other question is where um, this is slightly different from, um, I'm assuming all the regular site plan approval and planning board and, and all those things have already kind of taken place for this development. Well, if, if it's Change to TND, or you even want to if look it at the other stays. map while you sit. I'm trying to. <laughs> uh, will this trigger another planning board process? Where you will have to go. Yes. You know, because this is different from from the plan. So right. This is um, an additional area. If the, if um, the council approves the TND extension here, um, it would need to go to the planning board for subdivision review. Um, I guess either under scenario, the R4 would need to go through subdivision review. Um, the addition to the TND and that design would go through subdivision review. So this is just the beginning of the process in terms of what the design looks like and then the engineering and the lot layout, et cetera. Um, but it dictates the style of development, basically. This decision is dictating style more than, um, more than the process. I guess maybe I uh, maybe I do have a question for Carrie, but maybe sure. you can answer. I'm getting a little confused when I'm looking at this. So I know I because in the map that we have, the streets aren't labeled. Can you show me in correlation to the um, parcel that we're talking about? Is that Ward Street? Is I think what he's what you're planning on coming off from? Ward so, Street's here. Okay. And this is the end of Ward Street where it's. Um, it, the pavement ends, it becomes the access road that Carrie was describing. Okay, okay. This is Westwood Avenue here. Um, town Hall's over here, Route One's up off, off the plan. Um, so the discussion has been any development here would connect to Ward Street or potentially also connect to the rest of the neighborhood, I assume. Carrie can clarify that on his attentions. The other access points to area. This is Commerce Drive where you enter today if you were to go into the neighborhood. 
this is the Eastern Road, and then that's Black Point Road. So that's the Black Point Road Eastern Road intersection. Um, so those are those are the two currently approved road connections, Ward Streets, possible as well for development up in this part of the project. And it might be helpful just to point out on that map, I know it's labeled, but just to point out what has approval currently and what it needs to come back to planning board. I think that's an important point as it relates to this request. Sure. Um, I don't know if you can be exact, but uh, you know, you, I think you can probably indicate on that plan what has planning board approval already and what needs to come back still. The planning board's approved the lot layout for essentially this part of the project. So the access road, Ballantyne Drive in, the lot, the houses that are built today along in here. Right now this phase is well underway. That's all approved. And then um, essentially south of this road, is that right, Carrie? Down to Eastern Road is all approved by the planning board and through traffic permitting. Okay. This is part of the TND. Um, the traffic movement permit considers um, those houses as part of their approval, but the actual layout has not been approved yet because of some wetlands and some additional design detail that Kerry is going to be doing with his engineer. So we'll, well, this is probably a question for you then, Kerry. <laughs> well, those three, I'm looking, so that top quarter towards where um, the zone change is, is not have approval yet. Will that need to change that layout in order to accommodate mm. access to that parcel? Yes, it, you probably can't see it, but what this says right here is for conceptual purposes only, phase okay. nine. We're just saying this is a design this is a design pattern, one of a million that it could look like. All we tried to do was in talking with the town about bringing in a package that was understandable, that was, okay, bring in what you have approvals for, show us what um, this could look like, and the reason why I didn't show it on here is because I work without a state designers, they're very expensive, um, but um, this will probably not look like this. This was actually done by my engineer. Uh, was one, it was, a, uh, it was, a, it was a, uh, a conceptual design that the planning board requested, I believe, about two years ago uh, for, you know, what another phase could look like. So we did it just to satisfy that. But um, I had engineer, or excuse me, I had designers here this summer, uh, spent a week. We did a pretty intensive charrette. Um, and the design that they came up with, I don't like, so I'm not moving forward with that one. So there's many different types that you can do, and that's another part of the complexity with that one there, where the other parcel is smaller, it's closer, it topography-wise is easier, and um, and our move and our traffic movement permit allows us uh, the number of trips to bring it into the TND without. Uh, needing to amend a traffic movement permit, if you will. And we would uh, intend to, with the development of it, improve the road going out through Ward Street and, uh, and at the same time connect down to the neighborhood uh, so that we have the more connections, the better. But, you know, if we're successful tonight, and getting the TND overlaid, if you agree that our design pattern should continue, then, and we come back to the planning board, um, we're not going to ask to use uh, Westwood Avenue. I've you know, been pretty clear about it. Okay, you're not. Yeah, um, I, I share the concerns of the people in that neighborhood. I've spent time in that neighborhood and I've sold some property in that neighborhood and whatever. Um, my question is if you could flip it back to your, your little conceptual drawing there. Mm -hmm. um, you show that hammerhead, for lack of a better uh, description, at the end uh, mm -hmm. that looks like it adjoins with Westwood. What would you be proposing so that, because I know human nature, People are going to drive up and through there if something's mm -hmm. there, if it attaches. 
what would you propose to do so that that wouldn't happen? Because Westwood, I I use Westwood myself because I go over to the fire station uh, that way, um, and I agree with everything they've said about the neighborhood and you know getting out on a Route One from there. So I I would prefer to absolutely not see this be using Westwood at all. So what would you do to prevent that from happening? What would your planning be there? Well, you can't block it off because it provides access to the parcel down here, which is a five-acre parcel that the Sullivan family owns. Mm -hmm. They have rights through the property to get to their property. So you can't just block it off there and say, okay, well, you know, there's no way in or out. I do have and have created recently a 50 by 100 foot right of way. I'm planning on building a duplex right there. So there is a right of way that connects up there. But there's many things that, I mean, I can't speak for the planning board, but it's not uncommon to see a fire gate put in mm -hmm. where the fire department has access, but nobody else does. Mm -hmm. um, if you're asking me, would I tell you that I'm going to put a Jersey barrier right here so that people can't get out there? No. Mm -hmm. They're pretty ugly. I think there should at least be pedestrian connection if there's not a drivable connection. I will tell you that I think Westwood should be used for pedestrians, bicycles, mm -hmm. all day long. Vehicles, that's another matter. That would, that's my, that would be my yeah. concern. I mean, I don't know how else to, to, uh, to tell you. Um, you know, what my, um, uh, but I think that the planning board would probably need to weigh in on what they ultimately would like to see there. Um, if it's a TND design, in keeping with a TND quality design, if it's this design here, I suppose you could put, you know, a temporary um, gated access, uh, fire department access there, mm -hmm. but under the R4, a truck would need to back around here, so then it's going to negate that. Right. So, you if, know, it's, if, if you didn't do TND, if you didn't get TND, what would you do with this parcel? I think you're looking at it, the 15-minute design job that I did while I was eating my dinner. Okay, so that's the non-TND design? Right, that's pretty straightforward. That meets current zoning. No sidewalks, no street trees. Doesn't even call for curbing. Doesn't even call for sewer. It just says I can do four units to the acre. Right. I'm familiar with that zoning. So. Oh, but, okay. I was a little confused because I. Okay. I mean, I, mean, I, I you know, you, you bring up a good point. You know, what do you, what do, you do about that? Um, you know, I suppose you could, uh, you know, put uh, one way. Or put do not enter. I, I don't know. I mean, again, that's not, I mean, I, you know, the planning board is going to have a lot to say, I'm sure, about that. If residents want to show up and oppose the use of Westwood, I'm sure the planning board will, will take what they have to say into consideration and come up with something that, you know, meets their needs, meets the town's needs. But I don't need to run trips up Westwood Avenue. Sure because I've got a traffic movement permit for more dwelling units that I'm currently planning on building mm -hmm. as its dwellings are currently shown to go out com uh, Commerce Drive, right. Eastern Road, and Ward Street. So I don't need Westwood. Right. <coughs> That's it for questions me. Council of Ladies, uh, mm -hmm. can you just kind of uh, tell us what that piece of land would look like under TND? Uh, well, TND guidelines for TND are that um, it, you can do a 44 foot wide right of way. It must have curbing. Our TND standard says granite curbing, which is what we have in Eastern Village currently. We have granite curbing on both sides. We have six foot wide esplanades with street trees, five foot wide sidewalks on both sides. That's a standard. So, in other words, if we're going to develop it in a TND manner, we must put granite curbing in, we must put esplanades in with street trees, we must build five foot wide sidewalks. It also has uh, the requirement for uh, some type of open space, park, um, you know, there's ways that you can do that, uh, incorporate park, a park area into the middle of the neighborhood or... Primarily my, my point is 
would that road be there? Would that road go up to Westwood? Would there be a road in the TND area that went to Westwood? Well, it currently goes there now because it provides access for the homeowner there. There is currently no, no, a I'm, road I'm talking, right... I'm talking about the horizontal road there. You're talking about... That's uh, it. This one right here? Yeah. Well, I don't, I, I, I don't know. That's a design feature that... You know, okay, I mean, maybe might, not. Maybe there's a park. Maybe you do something like a turbine turn where you design a park in the middle. You have lots off each side of it. And if you imagine what a turbine looks like, where you have, you know, so that you cre that, that those are those are very quintessential New England uh, center of town, town center uh, designs. You know, something like that could go on it. I happen to own the parcel actually right here as well that abuts this. So I've got more land to put those two together. Um, you know, I mean, with the T, the great thing about the TND is it allows us so much flexibility to create something nice. The R4 is straightforward. 75 feet of frontage, uh, 10,000 square foot lot, and, uh, and that's it. So, um, that's to, that to me is just the screaming out reason why it should be designed. Sh I mean, there's some developers that would not want TND. They wouldn't want the restriction. They'd want to be able to develop it any way they wanted to. R4, straightforward. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. But putting an R, putting an, an R uh, TND overlay on it uh, put some burden on me to develop it in a in a consistent manner with what the TND guidelines are, and I can tell you our you know our road costs are approaching nine hundred dollars a foot. Mm -hmm. It's because of the infrastructure that we put into these places, so it's not cheap, but it's very nice. Um, in an R4, you can set the house back. Mm -hmm. In a TND, you must move it up front. It's got to be vertical scale. It's got to look like a neighborhood. I think what I've been hearing here is if you don't do the TND, it remains R4 and you can build a road through there and access goes to Westwood. And there's nothing anybody can do about it. I don't know whether that's right or not. Uh, and that definitely doesn't help the people that got up and complained about the traffic going through. Um, <coughs> If it is a TND, and Dan, you're going to have to help me on this, I'm assuming that you could put restrictions on uh, egress into and out of the property. So you could prevent a road from coming out of that property at that point, hooking up to Westwood. Before Dan speaks, I'll just make one point. If, if you decide that you don't want to let it be developed, TND, and I come back with R4, I'm not going to still propose going up Westwood Avenue and try and drive it down everybody's throat because people are up opposing me. I'll still respect the neighbors. Again, I still don't need to go that way. So I think the, I think that there's, I think I'm on, <laughs> the interesting thing here is we're kind of on the same side. I understand their concern and wanting to make sure that it doesn't get used. But I'm not going to come in and say, yep, R4, and I'm using Westwood, and that's all there is to it, and let the fight start. I don't have any interest in fighting. I understand that. I understand okay. that. Dan, can you answer my question? Okay, so just a minute. we got a little time out here. we got to have um, a motion on the floor in a second to continue. Oh, um, please. I'll, I'll move. I'll move second. Up. Okay. Um, discussion, then. Continue. <laughs> I was just going to comment. I think Carrie is correct in that this project's going to go to the planning board, whether it's an R4 subdivision or a TND subdivision. Traffic's going to be looked at. Access points going to be looked at. I think that, to me, the two or three distinguishing features here are the TND provides more flexibility in terms of lot size, how it's laid out. Maybe it could be more creatively laid out to not be a direct connection like this, mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, there are higher standards in a TND, as 
as discussed. There's requirements for sidewalks, there's requirements for street trees, um, some common space. So I think flexibility coupled with higher expectations <coughs> are the key differences. Um, and in terms of road connections or not, I think that flexibility in the TND helps this parcel be laid out better without a layout like this. Then we put restrictions on egress? The, the planning board, I think based on public notice and their subdivision process is, and already carries suggestion that he'd prefer to use Ward Street based on what he understands concerns are. Uh, I don't expect the planning board's going to head in the other direction. Um, I think that if there's good means of access internal to Eastern Village, then I, I suspect that's the direction they would go. My, my concern is still the people who live on Westwood. To me, that they have to be protected from the possibility of a road coming out of there and people, and it's not you, Mr. Anderson, it's all the people that are going to live down there. If all of a sudden they realize, hey, there's a little shortcut that we can use, well, bingo, it's I people are going to use it. I think that could be addressed to give comfort to the concern of what happens 10 or 20 years from now in terms of lot layout. If, all, if, if that area is laid out and sold off as private lots and there's no public right-of-way that's maintained that we could ever exercise our rights to use, then I think you effectively address that future concern. Mm -hmm. I, I, did, I did have one, little, one question, and maybe it's not fair. Um, you know, Carrie just put this, uh, this plan together here, and you've not done any planning on the, under the TND uh, scenario, but it strikes me, given a two-and-a-half-acre lot, is there much of any difference at all in terms of density? Can you get more lots out of the T&D than you could under the conventional? Mm -hmm. Two. Two additional. Two additional. Or? It's, it's. Yeah, right. you'd, have to build a, you'd have to build an affordable housing component. It's four units per acre as the base density. R4 mm -hmm. is four units per acre. And the T&D allows the additional unit through a bonus. That, so. mm -hmm. That's under just the, the straight analysis, but it strikes me if you're going to work a road in and back out, whether through a cul-de-sac or some other unique lot design, okay. you're going to be consuming some of that two and a half acres. So uh, I'm guessing that though the, the math might suggest you can get t yield two more lots on that land once you lay out the roads and consume land with public streets, yeah. you might be looking at the same number of lots total. It also could depend on housing type too, but I don't want to. Sure. I think the, the only thing that I'd add is to to take the TND from because it has an R4 base uh, density, which is what the property's been zoned for I don't know 80, 70 years. But in order to go from the four units per dwelling per per acre to the five there's the requirement that there be an affordable housing component. So. I have one more question for Dan. Sure. Uh, I have one for him too. I know I've seen in some areas um, something of a barricade, like, like has been maybe mentioned about mm -hmm. use there. Is that something the town imposes, or was that something people voluntarily, like I know, for instance, Berry Road, when it connected, you know, out by me to right. the development, um, yeah. yeah, often that was done Gate that for a second means of access to roads that are longer than is typically allowed, primarily for emergency response. Um, so that's most of the circumstances where there's this another way in that has a gate that um, public safety has the ability to open quickly, mm -hmm. but isn't for... Um, that's something we impose as a town. That's something we agree to to let maybe them build a longer road than we otherwise would like, and I'm, sometimes there's actually issues with those because they're hard to maintain in the winter for that emergency response. So it's not something that's ideal for the town. Okay. Um, in some circumstances, it's something we've lived with and, and maybe haven't, um, wouldn't do again. Uh, in this, but that's maybe a solution here. Um, mm -hmm. I tend to think that whether it's R4 or T&D, there's a diff some design options here that could be afforded. I think there's more design options under TND to 
get away from an interconnected road there and to have a lot there or have just a path or something like that that's not a vehicular connection. Um, that's where the TND helps allow smaller lots and creatively designed lots to, to get away from a more um, conventional square layout. Dan, one thing while you're there. Um, for uh, TND design on that lot, um, one means of egress would be um, acceptable or not other than emergency? Yeah, I think the distance to, um, say, Ward Street here, and then Carrie showed this. This shows, you know, Ward Street coming down in a concept right. for how there may be a couple ways in to this site. Again, it needs to be designed, but as long as where multiple ways in converge to one access point, as long as that one access point isn't more than 2,000 feet long, the fire department, emergency services, or public safety is comfortable with that. If it's beyond 2,000 feet, that's when you need to get into these other means of access. So, I mean, what's your opinion on it? Would uh, Westwood Avenue wouldn't need to be used? No, it wouldn't. That's okay. This is maybe 500 feet. Right. Seven, so I'm not sure how far it is, but it's, it's well less than 2,000 feet. So then, if, if we went full with the approval, they they wouldn't need to use Not it. from a length of dead on road standpoint. No. The fire chief is here, if he wants to comment <laughs> on it. <laughs> um, right but, on you know, it, yep. not from a, <laughs> under a typical scenario, no. If there's multiple ways in and then it's a relatively short dead end road, then they've been comfortable with that. So, I mean, how comfortable are you saying that it won't be used? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on the spot. It all comes back to design. If it's yeah. designed, the planning board well, wants to see the other access points used like they did before. I mean, as Carrie said, this whole project was approved focusing Commerce, Black Point, and Ward Street and not using okay. Westwood. So, I don't yeah. see that changing in light of concerns of the neighbors and Carrie's interest in not using Westwood either. So I don't see the planning board unless there's some mm -hmm. other compelling reason we're not aware of um, making a different decision on that. All right. um, anyone else have questions, Adina? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Gary. Yes. Let's uh, clear something up. Um, we had an, an accusation tonight. The, par the property that you're looking at uh, putting into a T and D zone. Who did you purchase that from? I purchased it from the estate of Christine Conley. No relation to Sullivan at all. No, sir. Okay. Uh, the parcel that we're talking about that uh, you mentioned that was Sullivan property, that belongs to Danny and Brenda Sullivan alone, not Sullivan family. I have nothing to do with that uh, piece of property. My house resides at one Sullivan Farm Road which is, I'm going to say, pretty close to a mile away by the crow flies. Over here. So I have no interest. Um, Mr. Anderson and I probably haven't spoken for four or five years. And I do not do any business with uh, Mr. Anderson, so I find no conflict of interest at all. Um, I think, uh, if anything, selfishly, I'm protecting Westwood Avenue for neighbors that I grew up with and, um, and probably my brother. So if that's an uh, issue for me to recuse myself from, I will. But I, uh, it has nothing to do with the property itself. I think uh, uh, Mr. Anderson's uh, proposed, uh, um, I, I think, a, a pretty uh, well, better than what I thought it would be. Um, presentation tonight, even though we can't see what it's going to look like, if it's uh, anything like the neighborhood he has been building, it's you know it, it will fit in well. Um, I Cameron, think the just with all due respect, yes, I think yes. you've you've properly disclosed your yes. interest. I, I think it's then the the duty of oh, the well, body well, to yes. rule or consider whether that rises to the level of conflict. I right, okay, yes. Yeah, stop you right. there before right. you, you get into that. Yeah. Um, I know you've stated you don't think so, but I think it's the body's uh, responsibility okay. to make that ruling. Yeah. 
I, well, I'll go first. I find no reason for you to need to recuse yourself. I appreciate that it is somehow family. Um, <laughs> disclosing that's important. Um, but where you're not a direct butter, you yourself have no direct. I believe our definition has to do with a financial gain. So um, obviously there has been none for you. Um, I don't have a problem with you voting. I would, agree with, I would agree with Council Holbrook. I agree, too. I agree. Okay, being the chair, um, uh, Tony, I meant, now do we take a vote on it? Or? I, I think you could, just to be, just to be clear on the record. Yeah. Uh, All in favor? Uh, mm -hmm. favor of Richard being able to vote? Uh, or being, um, to be able to vote or for recusing himself from the vote? Recusing himself. So for him not to vote, all those in favor of him not voting, I guess. No. <laughs> <laughs> we need that in the form of a motion, I guess. I have. That's the other question I have. I think Tody, who's so good on those rules. <laughs> Usually it's no the other runs that, but with a chair, there's no conflict. There's no conflict. That he has no conflict with the um, order at hand. So Thank you. I'm sorry to stop you midstream of your thoughts. I just wanted to make sure the, the record was clear in that regard. Um, so um, I, I like the, I think you probably, Jessica, like the um, mention of uh, affordable units on that property, um, which I think should be noted for your sake in the, um, in any notes to the um, planning board. Mm -hmm. um, on that, um, it, you know, like I said, if we're protecting Westwood Avenue from um, traffic, um, I think it's it's a good thing. Um, where uh, Zone 4 um, wouldn't do that. He can just mm -hmm. go ahead and put the road in and um, there's nothing really to stop that. So I think all in all it's a good plan. It uh, was presented um, better than I thought. I would like to have seen some sketches of it, but those will come in due time. So, um, any other questions, comments? All right, with that, I'll call for a um, vote. All in favor? Opposed? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Order number 14-10 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the new request for a liquor license from Arthur Geekus. Doing business as Pizza Plus, Inc., located at 491 Payne Road. Approval? Anyone from the public? Second. A public hearing. Yeah. Well, so <laughs> <the first. laughs> My bad. Anyone from the Sorry. public like to speak on this yeah. order? Seeing none, uh, move forward uh, with a motion. Move approval. Now second. <laughs> All in favor? Opposed? You're opposed, Jim? No. In favor? Yes. Okay. Order number 1411 is 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the new request for a food handler's license from Douglas and Linda Duvall doing business as Mammy's Farmhouse located at 97 County Road. Okay. Anyone in the audience like to speak on this order? Seeing none? Move approval. Move second. All in favor? Opposed? None. I might just say one quick thing is welcome to the community. Oh, yeah. Very nice couple. Uh, Under old business, the order number 14-12 is act on the names posted to the various committees and boards as recommended by the Appointments Committee on January 15th. Councilor Holbrook. I don't. Sorry. Um, slacking. Sorry. Do you have one? I do. Um, okay, they will be appointing Terry okay. Toomey and Robert Willett as full voting members uh, for the Shellfish Conservation Commission. Um, reappoint Terry Toomey and Robert Willett as full voting members with terms to expire in 2016 and move David Green from first alternate to a full voting member with a term to expire in 2014. Mm. I humbly recuse myself, that's why. Um, I would like to recuse myself from this vote. Uh, one of the nominations is David Green, who is my father. No, I, that, I don't even think you need to vote. Yeah, okay. It's a direct yeah. familial, right. familial relationship. I think the conflict is clear. Okay. I will also like to mention that I did not partake in 
the appointment either I recuse myself right. from the appointment yeah. process. Okay. So. I move approval. Second. All those in favor? None opposed. Under new business, order number 14-13 is first reading referred to the planning board on the proposed amendment to chapter 405, the zoning ordinance to repeal contract zone district 4 between the town of Scarborough and Harold P. Burnham II. I think Dan has a couple of introductory comments regarding the contract zone. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, this is related actually to uh, some zoning changes the council acted on, I think about two years ago at this point, in the Pine Point area. As I think most of the council was, the current council was involved uh, at the time when the zoning. Um, along Pine Point Road in the vicinity of Snow's Canning, the old Snow's Canning facility, the Clam Bake, and also um, what used to be primarily an industrial um, industrial zone, an industrial park at the end of Holly and Bickford Streets off of Pine Point Road, and this is a, a map that illustrates that area. Um, at the top of the screen is Pine Point Road. The two streets that come down are Bickford and, and Holly. Um, and this area was, like I said, rezoned from more of an industrial area to uh, more of a residential mixed-use type area. This is Bickford and Holly Streets are residential streets that then um, led to an industrial zone. And uh, the Long Range Planning Committee, working with the council, decided this was a better area for residential type development in the future or light commercial, perhaps, uh, marine type development, given the location uh, in Pine Point, and that over time the industrial properties could redevelop into that type of um, development that's more consistent with the, the surrounding properties. One thing that um, wasn't done with this zoning update was there's actually a contract zone uh, at the end of Bickford Street on 24 Bickford Street. It's outlined in red on the map that's before you. And this contract zone was established in the late 90s to actually allow a single family house to be built on what then was an industrially zoned property. So industrial zone doesn't allow residential development. Um, so now that the industrial zone that uh, is the underlying zoning that applies to the property has gone away, um, and the TVC4 is in place that allows residential development, the contract zone really isn't necessary anymore. Uh, the contract zone is allowing for something that's allowed for in the underlying zone that exists. In fact, the contract zone is more restrictive residentially than the new zone because it only allows one single family house when the TVC4 um, allows two per acre, and there's about five or six acres here. Not all of it is developable land. but um, So this has been uh, proposed. It's gone to the Long Range Planning Committee, really, as kind of a cleanup item um, from the past, and also the property owner who it applies to has reviewed it um, and is encouraging the change um, so that the property isn't now overly restricted um, like it is through the contract zone. So this is the current map and then, sorry here, um, this, this shows you what the zoning map would look like with the contract zone being taken off and it essentially just is going to uh, include the TVC4 that already re applies to the property quote unquote underneath the contract zone or in addition to contract zone, that little panhandle or tail on um, the zoning map there that's outlined in orange, that's proposed to be TVC4 also because it's part of the same property. The Long Range Planning Committee has been trying to zone properties in their entirety, um, the same zone unless there's a compelling reason not to. So that's what they're recommending to, to include that area. Um, I think it simplifies um, uh, the zoning out there. Also, in the zoning ordinance, there's language deleting the contract zone four. At the end of the zoning ordinance, there's each contract zone and its restrictions and standards. So there's a companion piece in the ordinance that deletes 
the contract zone for, given that it's deleted off the zoning map. Okay. Um. Is there a motion? Move approval. Second. Second. Is there any questions or discussion? Okay. Um, all in favor? Any opposed? I see none. Move that to the planning board. Order number 14-14 is act on the request to accept the $5,000 donation from the estate of Lewis and Tina Feinberg to the Scarborough Fire Department. Chief Thurlow will um, make a presentation on that. I'll get out of Chief's way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Tina and Louis Feinberg were uh, residents of Pine Point. I knew them personally for a number of years. They used to trade at my retail seafood establishment back in my youth. Uh, just real salt of the earth people. Uh, they've been very generous to the town. I know that they, they gave the Scabber Educational Foundation over $100,000 in the past. And uh, both Tina and Louis have passed away now and we were notified by the estate uh, that they left a couple of uh, final bequests in their uh, estate planning, one of which was a $5,000 donation to the fire department. Uh, we're going to put that into our thermal imaging camera account, similar to the donations that I was here just a few months ago from the Black Point community, uh, and put those towards a project that we're working on right now to replace some of our 10-year-old cameras. So I just wanted to, to once again thank the, the family and uh, acknowledge the very generous gift. Thank you. That, that's a very important purchase, yeah. thermal engine, imaging. Yes. And very useful in the fire service. Um, I guess, uh, thank you. Thank you. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Well, I'd like to thank um, the uh, estate. That was a very thoughtful donation. It will be put to good use. All those in favor? Accepted. Opposed? No. Order number 14-15 is act on the request to accept the following street pursuant to Title 23 of the Main Revised Statute, subsection 3025, and the requirements of Section 4 of the Scarborough Street Acceptance or Ordinance, Homer Sands Drive, which is located in the Cascade Falls subdivision. Uh, just very quickly by way of introduction, in accordance with the Street Acceptance Ordinance, uh, the town engineers uh, has verified that they've met all of the requirements and obligations, and, and so this matters before you to formally accept this portion of road uh, as a public street. No discussion. Okay. Second. Any discussion? Comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Order number 13-16 is act on the request to accept the following easement deed pursuant to Title 23, Main Revised Statutes 3025, and the requirements of Section 4 of the Street Acceptance Ordinance, the drainage easement deed on property located along Elmwood Ave on the, at the intersection of Green Acre Lane and the Green Acre, in the Green Acre, Acre Subdivision. Sorry. I'm tongue twister. <laughs> Simply as a uh, matter of uh, a condition of the approval of the seven lot subdivision off Green Acre Lane, uh, it was proposed uh, to have a drainage easement uh, for those lots to drain back to the, what is now town owned property. Uh, for those of you that were around, this was the area subject of quite a heated zoning change discussion mm -hmm. involving Maine Eye Care, but it's now seven, the frontage of this property is now uh, developed into seven residential homes. So this uh, simply uh, officially has the town accept uh, that uh, and, and allow a permanent drainage easement to exist on that property. Motion. Move the question. Second. Discussion. No one needs to discuss. You want to go home. <laughs> All those in favor. Opposed? None. 
Order number 13-14-17, uh, act on the request from the deputy tax collector to authorize the town manager to sign a release deed on property located at 91 Ashwamp Road, Map U3, Lot 31. Um, as is, happens on occasion, uh, there were liens placed on property for unpaid taxes. Those have now been since been satisfied and we're looking for your authorization to issue a release deed to clear their title. So moved. Check. Any questions? All those in favor? Thank you. Standing committees and special reports. Um, we'll start with Councilor Blaze. Nothing. Councilor Benedict. Nothing. Councilor Katarina. I do have something. Okay. <laughs> Um, uh, Councilor Donovan and I went to our first PACS meeting. It was basically an introductory meeting, so we will be going back March 20th for uh, meetings on the transportation and issues in the area. Uh, Long-term planning committee, we're working on basically the golf course. It, it goes from Gorham Road to Holmes Road. It abuts my property across the street. Just looking at uh, possible changes and working with the uh, golf course owners on uh, some zoning and how it makes sense long term for the town of Scarborough. And then the Conservation Commission, we met with the developer of, it's a proposed uh, subdivision in Leighton Farms off from Green Acres. Um, they wanted some feedback on their sketch plans and we gave them that on Monday. And that's it. Council Holbrook. Uh, let's see, what is it? I have a couple of things. My, my first one would be that um, appointments met this evening, so we have a name to post. I would like to post the reappointment of Penny as Dorian for the Personal Appeals Board. And we've got Housing Alliance. Housing Alliance will be meeting on February 27th at 6.30. Um, they did have um, an informal meeting um, and what will be coming to the council probably, I'm not sure when yet, but soon um, they'll need to have an amended uh, memorandum of understanding, which was between us as a town with Habitat for the pro property on Broad Turn Road. Um, so again, I'm sure that'll be the source of, of their next meeting. Historic Preservation will be meeting on March 3rd at 6.30 here in Town Hall. Um, again, coming to us actually will be our um, our next meeting, if I'm remembering correct. Here as a council, um, they have prepared, if you will, the short list. It's what's significant and endangered and what's left in town and that has kind of the highest value, things to be aware of um, and to look for, for ways to help encourage preservation. Um, that short list will be coming at the next council meeting as well as just a general update of their work. Um, right now, they're currently working with Dan Bacon, who's been gracious to give us his time from the planning department, and he's been helping um, with some ideas and, and helping work with some language to create some flexibility within maybe zoning and, and code and, and whatnot to um, um, help foster the approach that they've had, which has always been that volunteer approach to con you know, preservation for, for historic sites. Um, Finance Committee will be meeting February 20th at 9 a.m. That will be a joint workshop between um, the Council Finance Committee and the School Finance Committee. And the um, Council Liaison is Kate Sinclair, and she is also um, planning on joining us. Um, and one other quick note, if I might add, um, I wish I could say I found this on my own. I did not. Harry Anderson handed it to me this evening. Um, but this does tie into that um, Housing Alliance and Affordable piece. Um, he does have, um, within his development, he is starting to look for, um, and for people at home too, um, he is ready for the um, workforce housing piece of his development. So he's looking for applications. Um, that meet the criteria. Like I said, this was in the current. Um, so mm -hmm. there is some general information in the ad that he's placed that kind of talks about income guidelines and how to qualify and how to get in touch with him um, for that. And I will pass that information on to Housing Alliance as well. 
Um, and that's it from my liaison report. Okay, hey, uh, Ordinance Committee um, has been unable to meet uh, once because of a snowstorm and <laughs> today because of a sickness uh, of Kate Sinclair, and, which is the chair, and myself was unable to attend because uh, was at work. Uh, there was only two members left to attend. Uh, so that was canceled. Um, the, uh, the other one would be um, uh, Transportation Committee. Uh, I was unable to attend again because due to working in the fire station. So um, do you have any updates with that, Tom? Or? I don't. I, I do know that the, uh, they're getting very close to wanting to come and make a presentation to the council uh, really in advance of your budget time. Uh, it's going to be a, uh, a combination of different uh, proposed improvements to the Oak Hill intersection, which was their first in, in primary task that they were asked to look at. Uh, so I think that timing is working out very well. Uh, right now we're engaged um, talking to a number of property owners, uh, namely the Sitco gas station on the corner. That's kind of the final piece to fall in place in terms of the um, package of suggested improvements. So we're hopeful that we'll come together and be a public report to the council um, in time for budget. All right, and I still have a component to complete myself, which I haven't had time to do because of everything else going on for the time being, but I will get to that. Uh, and um, I guess it's fire up again. Okay. A couple of quick uh, items to update you on. The uh, Ad Hoc Animal Control Advisory Committee has wrapped up its meetings. Their final ninth meeting was this past Monday. Uh, I now have the task of drafting a report. I can tell you really as a function of time uh, and somewhat of attention, uh, the report should be fairly brief, I'll say, and straightforward. It's really intended to um, get the, the basic principles and concepts uh, to the council as quickly as possible. And on that note, uh, perhaps Chairman Sullivan will speak to it more. There's been tentative discussion of the council meeting at 6 p.m. next Wednesday before your regular meeting in a workshop session uh, to uh, talk about as a group and digest uh, that committee's report. So I, I'll, I don't mean to steal his thunder, but I want to make sure if that's the case, we, we mentioned that this evening. I do know a, m a number of the committee members will be present that evening and available should there be questions. Um, also, this week, Monday, uh, we launched the Newtown website. You might have noticed in front of you, I placed the, we had these actually printed up just to hand out to residents and help publicize with their pens and these little pads of paper. And Tody actually donned a T-shirt on Monday to help publicize the uh, launch of the new website. Uh, we're extremely pleased. We have actually a survey tool on that website, and the feedback to date has been very positive in terms of its look and functionality. Uh, like everything else, it's a work in progress, but I think we're, we're very pleased with the, uh, the initial rollout of the new site. Uh, staff did meet with DOT today regarding the replacement of the bridge structure at the lower end of Pine Point Road. This is the bridge that passes over the Amtrak rail line. Mm -hmm. uh, that bridge deck is uh, vintage late 40s, and, and it's not just the deck, the, the entire structure is, is beyond repair and needs to be replaced. Um, that area is challenging in that it's uh, kind of landlocked. Uh, there's no reasonable detour around that area, and so we talked at length about and, and we're very pleased, I should say, that they uh, fully explored uh, three general options for that work. The first would be to, to uh, kind of get, construct the bridge in two halves, so as to keep one lane of traffic, um, one lane open at all times. Um, you know, that's uh, about a 24-month cycle, two full construction mm -hmm. seasons to do that. Uh, this is also challenged by the fact that there's right now 12 trains that pass daily on that track, and there needs to be a 30-minute clear zone before that scheduled time with the train passes where everything and everybody has to move out of the way. So it's a very delicate area, and that's true of all the options. Um, so that's the first option, to do it kind of in two halves. The next is a full closure, which is clearly the fastest construction. If the contractor can have full access and control of the site, um, they'd be looking at a full closure for about eight weeks, which is um, unfathomable. Uh, to public safety the, and certainly to the residents that live in that area. Uh, though it's a, about an eight-mile detour, uh, depending on the time of year, it's probably a 40-minute detour uh, all the way down to the middle of Old Orchard and back up East Grand Avenue. 
And so I'm pleased to say the third option um, is the construction of a temporary bridge that would allow two-lane traffic throughout the, the term of the project. Um, the point of meeting with staff is uh, they wanted to get ready for a public meeting which is scheduled in these chambers for Tuesday, March 11. I believe a notice was provided at your place this evening. Um, and I think for obvious reasons they wanted to be able to present the options and, and talk about the preferred option. And at least from staff's point of view, we've, we far prefer the option of building a temporary bridge and allowing two-way continuous access throughout the course of construction. So stay tuned. Uh, the timeline would have that project starting in the fall of 2015 and completing about uh, 13 to 14 months thereafter. Uh, two other points of interest. Um, I made mention by email to the members of council, but Scarborough uh, hit the big screen over the weekend, uh, 10 o'clock last Saturday morning. Scarborough was featured on a show called Born to Explore. This taping occurred over the course of several days this past summer. Uh, it featured uh, Mark Colston, one of our fellow for local lobstermen in Pine Point area. Uh, they did some traditional clam bake on Ferry Beach, uh, and they did some work down in Bitterford Pool. But I, I must say Scarborough fared uh, very well, looked very good on the big screen. Um, tax bills were sent today, so I suspect they will arrive in mailboxes as soon as tomorrow. Due date for second half of taxes is March 17th. And lastly, just to mention, I am speaking uh, first thing in the morning uh, tomorrow to the Scarborough Community Chamber. It's at least an annual, if not semi-annual, thing I try to do uh, to get out. And it's always an engaging audience, a lot of thoughtful questions and tough ones. So um, I'm hopeful to get home and get some sleep so I can be fresh and ready for them in the morning. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I'm not taking questions tonight. No. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to know if you had an update on the dredging. Good question. I, I don't believe the project started in earnest. They've mobilized and have been mobilized for well over a month. Um, frankly, I haven't given, been given straight answers, nor have I pursued it that hard. But I believe there are some delays. I don't believe they started the project yet. And it, it has to do with some dispute or issue between the contractor and the Army Corps at this point but the contractor has been on site and in the water for mm -hmm. at least three weeks that I'm aware of. Okay. I can't explain why they've not begun. Uh, I will find an answer to that and certainly share that with the council. Thank you. Thanks. Council of Comments. Council Blaze. Um, yeah, I just have one comment, and that's, I should have reported that under the committee report. It's okay. Tom and I attended the uh, SEDCO board meeting last week, I believe, and they presented their budget for 2014-2015, uh, and they are showing a 10% reduction in their spending, so. Helping the cause. Right. <laughs> One down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's it. That's it. Okay. Council of Benedict. I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Canarino. Uh, just very quickly, uh, update everyone on the municipal revenue sharing bill. It's in the legislature. Uh, Scarborough, as you may be aware, stand to lose half a million dollars if this bill didn't pass. Uh, so far it has passed through the House and the Senate. There's probably some more tinkering going on because of the process. Not sure what the governor will be doing. I do want to thank uh, Representatives Volk and Soraki, who so far have voted to support our resolution and our town. Um, but we do need to stay vigilant and continue to make sure that um, they stay with us on this. I know both of the senators, Boyle and Millett, uh, support the bill strongly. So, thank you. Great. Councilor Holbrook. Uh, yeah, I have two things. Um, I don't have a, a full vetting, but I, I did um, want to say um, there were two two passings I, I wanted to send our condolences to, and then I'll do a full list the next meeting. But um, I was remiss the last month, and um, Don Deegan passed away. He was um, a Pine Point resident. He was also um, a lifetime resident from Scarborough. Um, he was one of our local fishermen. Um, so my apologies, but our condolences to his family. Um, as well as a um, another lifetime resident um, was a couple years ahead of me in school, um, 
who suddenly passed. So our condolences to the family of Lee Beeman. Mm -hmm. And I, oh, yeah, one more thing. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm ready for bed. Um, I do want to say that I, I did receive a letter, um, or I shouldn't say it wasn't a letter. Um, we, we as a council as a whole um, received a letter today through the clerk's office. Um, asking for um, one of the counselors to sponsor um, a set of recommendations from this individual. Um, I myself, and, and, and the, to support the recommendation, one of the requests was to add it to the information we get for the workshop, which I can fully support as having that included in the information we're looking at um, with the assenting opinion and the dissenting opinion and whatnot. Um, but the other request to that was for um, a counselor to sponsor that as a, an agenda item at our next meeting. Um, for myself, I can't support that. There, there were some recommendations from, from this person, um, mostly all around dates and times and, and, and those sorts of things. Um, but, but certainly I can't support that at this time. I, I would prefer to see some roundtable discussion um, as a counselor, I'm also well aware of our rules and policy. If we did pass something, we wouldn't be able to take anything else up for another year. So I would much prefer to have a bigger conversation before um, I just blindly accept the document um, to have some time to kind of rule it out. So again, I'm just saying that I have no intention of um, sponsoring the petition. Is that for me? Thank you. Um, I just want to concur with uh, Council Holbrook's comments um, on the um, sponsoring of an agenda item. I truly believe that it would undermine the workings of the ad hoc committee at this point. <clears throat> it definitely will be presented during the uh, workshop, which we're, uh, Tom mentioned it will be at 6 p.m. Wednesday, February 19th, we'll have the workshop and all the options will be discussed. Um, and uh, I don't know which way this council will go. Um, and we'll move from there. But to uh, sponsor an agenda item for that same night is, I feel, is putting the cart before the horse. Um, and, and we can look at that at that. Um, workshop. Um, I would like to send my condolences out to the Bemis family, uh, in which I knew, and Sandra Googins and her family. Sandra does an awful lot of uh, volunteer work in the town, uh, especially for Engine 4 and the fire department canteen. So, um, and uh, he will be so sorely missed. Um, big part of the fishing community down at Pine Point. And um, I think pretty much that um, concludes my counselor comments. And I guess the next thing would be a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Adjourn.